Dave Akens, a designer from the Netherlands. Uh, what's your job? Can you describe your job? Uh, I would say usually I work on projects that sort of try to work on a global problem, trying to uh, yeah, find a solution for it. A big project we've been working on in the last years is plastic, yeah, doing something about plastic waste. So we uh, develop here machines to recycle plastic and we share all the blueprints open source online for free so everyone in the world can download the blueprints and start recycling plastic locally. If you were to describe your uh, daily routine, what do you do as a designer? Where do you start uh, when you are to come up with a new solution that is breakthrough to the world? Well, I think I don't really have a routine. It just depends a lot on how I... More my, my schedules are more formed by months, I think. Like every few months I do something else. But usually I spend quite some time researching, like figuring out how the world works just by traveling, seeing how waste ends up in uh, landfills or textile industries being used in Bangladesh, like just understanding where problems come from. Then usually I spend quite some time in my workspace just to uh, come up with a solution. Sometimes it's a machine, sometimes a video, sometimes a concept, sometimes a product, whatever makes sense. And then also digital is quite a big part to really document it into videos or website to share it with the world. So it depends a bit on which stage the project is, what I'm doing. So if I'm traveling, I'm obviously have a different routine than when I'm uh, yeah, working in the workspace. We sort of jumped into another question. Where do you look for the inspiration? Where does it come from? Inspira on the one hand, if I just hear about global problems, which are a lot nowadays in the world, I always get like interested to dive into it, to learn more about it, to understand why it is a problem. So I would say in that sense, there's plenty of inspiration for projects to start. But I don't want to start too many because I also think it's good to focus on one instead of doing a little bit everywhere. So sometimes I have to limit myself, like don't dive into that hole. But yeah, so usually I find a lot of inspirations in, in just hearing what is an issue. And then also just, I don't know, looking around what are solutions, how people do with stuff. I guess inspiration at that point, if you're looking for a solution, comes really from everything. Okay. Um you are dealing with a, a specific kind of design, social design, design that is focused on environmental change. Uh, you search for new solutions for a certain phenomena that has been overwhelming consumers and also been dis destructive for the environment. But in the end, you need to earn money to, uh, to keep up your studio, to pay your employees or your partners. How do you do that? Where do you also, I think also meet? that, I think often looking at that, I think that's actually part of the problem. This feeling that you need to make money, otherwise you cannot sustain yourself. So you need to do projects you actually don't like or didn't think are good for the world, but you need the money. So I think that's also kind of uh, one of those big problems to work on. Like maybe it's the story of capitalism. So actually here, we also do that a bit different, just to explore and try out other stuff. So for instance, we share everything what we do open source online for free so everyone in the world can download it. We don't sell anything, we don't make any money. But then sometimes you want to develop new things like now we want to make a version 4. But because we share everything online for free, the local municipality said, hey, we have this empty building, we want to have it for one year for free. Okay. And so like, ah, okay, cool. So you're sort of giving stuff back. Then we also invited volunteers from over the world to help, like product designers, engineers, web developers. So in the last year we worked with 100 people and they were all volunteers to push the project forward. So in a way, you end up a bit more in sort of this gift economy. The, yeah, uh, the exchange economy. Yeah. But in the end, you need to pay rent for your flats, you need to buy food. Yeah, you know, so then we also thing. have, um, so sometimes we win an award, but I think what we like is a way of funding of people donating money. So we okay. have Patreon where people every month support a little bit of money. And with that, we can sustain the team. And I would say we don't really have an answer, but I, I do think it's also an interesting topic to explore, like how how can we work on projects we think are meaningful without feeling trapped that we need to do something else to make the money? And we don't have an answer, but we like to explore other options as well there. You come from a design world and you have a certain overview of how design has changed over the years. Uh, where is it going to and where it has come from? If you were to sum up, where are we now? Where is the design industry? and which path, paths it should take to become a vital branch of the industry of the world. And by vital, I mean the one that makes really a contribution and change. And which paths should be forgotten or abandoned? Yeah, so I think when I studied a few years ago, social and, and design and stuff wasn't really a thing. I, I was already starting this project actually about, I was like, we need to recycle plastic or reduce e-waste. But everyone there was like, so I was making machines and they could make products. So everyone there was like, what do you make? What's the product? I was like, it's not about the product, it's more about the machine or the 
the ecosystem behind it, like where materials come from. But everyone there was very focused on, or the teachers at least, were very focused on what does it look like. And I was kind of like, yeah, not really. And I noticed throughout the last years, it became way more normal to question like more the resources behind it or how it's being made. And the looks became a bit less relevant. Okay, um, so the function comes first. I think uh, it also the system behind it, like how does it operate and what resources does it take and how much does it give yeah. back and what's the, the end cycle of your project or product. Like if you just throw it away, where does it go? And if it goes to that country, how much does it harm? So I think nowadays designers have a much more overview of not just the product, but really all the resources it takes to make that thing. Trying to make sure it doesn't like pollute the world more. And because I think that's the worst feeling you can have as a designer. You make something that makes the world worse because I think every designer tries to make the world a bit better or improve it. But nowadays, hearing all these problems, it's, you often think like, fuck, it's designers or the people that make stuff that they create this mess. So I think more and more people became aware that they are the, making the mess and now looking for a way to... You yeah. know, what, what amazes me the most is that Viktor Papanek, I don't know if you have heard about him, he's a designer that he uh, has published a book in 1970s saying that designers are the most destructive profession mm. professionals uh, for the world because they're making more and more unneeded things, items for the world. And it was like 40 years ago that he mm. stated that designers should rethink the way they design and think of what really people need. His book was called Design for a Real World. And um, he was then opting for environmental friendly design and design only for those who need and how they need to design. You've mentioned that you have uh, graduated a few years ago and that your teachers or uh, professors, they have put a big emphasis on how the products or what you have designed look like. Do you have any remarks for the teachers and professors nowadays, what they should change in the way they educate young designers? Well, I think but maybe it's a bit arrogant to think, but I think listen better to the students because I think the world changes so quickly and with internet, having that sort of information available, I think nowadays students have more information than their teachers. The only thing teachers have is experience, but they have experience in a sort of outdated world. So, and often they try to put students in the way how the world worked 20 years ago. And I think I had that same friction, And but I felt comfort or more like like-minded people on the internet. So I was like, okay, the teachers might think different, but at least I know there's this massive world out there that thinks more like me. So I think as a teacher, I wouldn't want to go against it, but try to sort of enable these students, try to... Yeah, help them, even if you don't understand it. But I think they are more comfortable in the current day than an outdated teacher with different, yeah. What do you think is the, the greatest hardship in your work? The thing that you uh, find most difficult to tackle? I think the system we live in is like a, it's a big one. In terms of you can design a new product, but if you still buy it, you consume it, and you replace it by another one, the whole product can be completely circular, can be made from biodegradable materials, but it's still a waste of resources if we see it as a fashion, if we sort of dispose it after a year, just not because it's broken, not because it needs to be repaired, but just because there's a newer version available, like that looks different or nicer. I think that's often tricky, like with a lot of stuff, we always want the new thing, which makes the old thing Do you waste. think there is a ray of light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, like, yeah, but I think it's more of a maybe a mindset thing we need to change. So it's not it's about huge stuff, you know. It's yeah. the, you know like replacing the whole products year after year or fashion because of the season has changed. You 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 you're talking about changing mindset of yeah. billions of people, and that's why I'm asking about the ray of light because for me it seems as for now in, impossible. Although me myself, I think just um, just like you, I mean, we don't need the the consumption cycle to be ending like this, that you need to replace your stuff after a year just because you don't like it. Not really, just because someone else pushes you to buy new things mm. because he needs to earn uh, money. But I guess that changing the mindset of people is the, the hardest task you can take as a designer. Although I think that if we will change the, the environment around us, little bit of people by little people and if you add the individuals and change of their mindset into a bigger scale it might be feasible but i think it will take like you know a yeah. billion years but i mean even if they think about just now thinking about back how the mindset was at design academy six years ago and everyone was thinking about what it looks like and six years later everyone is thinking about social problems it can also change very quickly and um, I know. Um, how do you think we can do that are uh, events like uh, jdv are necessary? Are, are they meaningful for the changing of mindset of people? 
Uh, yeah, but I do think a lot of stuff is also built here in the old system. So you find new materials, you find new research, new ways of doing it, but it's often applied in the exact same ways as last 50 years. And I think, yeah, really changing that mindset sometimes requires a bit more of a change. But I think it's trying to find an alternative. I think a lot of people now know, okay, we don't like the current world, but what's the alternative? And there isn't really a very good solid plan. And I think the moment designers can sort of visualize that or prototype that or try it out, and I think the more clear that alternative becomes, the easier it is for people to change. But I think now it's sometimes that's just lacking. Like there are like a lot of different little alternatives, but nothing really that you imagine, well, this whole world we live in now could actually work like this. If you were not in the place you are right now, and if you were not Dave Hackins running Precious Plastic Project, what would you be? What would you do? Maybe being a bakery or something. Ah. Like something, <laughs> something simple. <laughs> yeah. And why is that? I don't know. Sometimes here, I think the more you know, the, it's not necessarily nicer for yourself. If I look at a product, I cannot see a product anymore. I see how it's being made. I see where it comes from. I see the materials that are in there. So if I look at the world around me, it just looks more complex than I think what you see if you don't know all the infrastructure behind it. Don't you take the, the, the strengths uh, to say, okay, I know how, how it's made. I know what it costs, not only money-wise, but also I, I know the, the carbon print. I know the cost of uh, disposing it. And I have a solution to this problem. I know how to make it. Yeah, so I think that's what I do now or try to do and make myself useful because I know I should do something with that information. But sometimes it's also just like heavy and it looks simpler if you don't have to do it. And in a way, everyone still needs to eat. So it's also nice if you make bread. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, what is the project you are the most proud of? Your project? Yeah, I think it changes more. I always get more excited by new projects what we try to do. And I think stuff can always be better. <laughs> but uh, I, I like this one, what we did now, that we really worked in this building with 100 people from around the world that didn't know each other at all. We just brought them together. Could easily go wrong in so many ways, like fighting or maybe they didn't understand each other. Maybe someone would chop off their finger. <laughs> but nothing happened in one year. And we did so many things. So many people made new friends. So many, such a strong group. I think a lot of like-minded people finding each other. That was kind of cool, I would say, like new. You didn't design a product, you didn't design, I don't know. Was... You've designed an ecosystem. Yeah, solution. sort of a little bit like, yeah. Have and that was just of, fun have, to have be. all of them uh, came to Eindhoven? Or, yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. here we have like all the, the version, people that helped. Currently we're like 48, but a lot of people had to leave because the visa has expired after three months. So we had to figure all this stuff out. Like there you have the daily tasks, like how do we organize ourselves? Who cleans the stuff? Who cooks? Who makes? What time do we even they eat? They were all living here yeah. in this building? Oh, yeah, so we had to find like 10 houses where, everyone, where like, all the people lived. This place was completely empty, so we had to put in, we built a kitchen. We like, this, yeah, we, we had no experience whatsoever in building sort of this work environment or community or however you call it. So a lot of stuff has went wrong. But everyone was very chill about it and yeah, it's cool. In the end, it worked pretty smooth. What is that you read recently? And what is that you listen to and the uh, movie you've watched most recently? I don't know. I, I often have um, moments when I absorb information and then I try to just get it everywhere, like documentaries or people or articles. But I think the last year we spent so much time developing that I, I don't really look around that much. I'm just... Focus on what you're doing. Yeah. When you are working, for example, do you listen to any music? Uh, I still listen to, listen to the same music as when I was 16, mm -hmm. like from Tony Hawk Pro Skater or something, like okay. a video game. Like I don't really develop there a lot. <laughs> sometimes I get new music from people here, but uh, yeah, sometimes this is just no music. Just and then you, now when we're ready, like next month, this is really ready, ready. Then I would have more time to like empty my mind and get some new information in. But now it's still a bit full, I guess, with it's stuff. It's still too yeah. overwhelming. What, what do you think about internet and possibilities internet has? Do you think that it's um, helping designers to develop, to, to inspire, or on the other hand, it is just so absorbing that being lost in the e-world seems that no one pretty much cares about what's happening in the real world? Yeah, I think it's a super powerful tool. Like it enables so many things, but it can easily be misused or overused or so it feels like one of those things you need to be careful with same as with i don't know maybe um food abundance like at some point we didn't have any food and then we have it but then you easily eat too much and people get overweight so you sort of need to be really yeah it's kind of a dangerous tool we need to use carefully i would say what advice would you give to yourself 10 years ago 
you see yourself 10 years ago sitting next to you and asking, hi, Dave, what, well, what should I do now? I don't know, plan more breaks, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Take more time off for her. Would you listen to yourself? Uh, no. no, no, but I <laughs> would have you, said it. <laughs> <laughs> would you listen to yourself now, yeah. saying to yourself, take uh, my breaks? Yeah, now a little bit slowly, but I feel now I'm at a different place as 10 years ago as well. So now I know set up a little bit stuff, people know the project, so I feel less the urge to do it now. And like 10 years ago, I felt like if I ever want to do this and I want to sustain myself, I really need to go 200%. And now it's a bit like, we will be okay. Would you recommend anyone to become a designer? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> thank you.